Hi, my name is Doug Rutter. I'm the president of RCS Sports Incorporated, the owner of The Collective and The E-Museum. How are you? I'm good. Yourself? Good. Pretty well. Yeah? It was a big tour, huh? Yeah, it's been sort of a weird one, but yeah, it was It was uh, great to be playing again, that's for sure. Yeah. Has it uh, changed much for you with um, uh, Walter being gone? Well, yeah, yeah, a little bit. I mean, um, when he was, when he was first gone, um, I think it was we played in 2018 without replacing him. So uh, that was that was quite different um, because you know all of a sudden there was a lot more space. You know, a lot, yeah. lot less. Yeah, a lot more space. Kind of reminded me of the sounds of the records a little bit more. Uh, and then, uh, but Donald uh, decided he wanted, uh, he likes the two guitar thing, I think, you know. And, yeah. And for certain songs, you, you know, you really got to have it, like Reeling in the Years or Bodhisattva or something like that. You know? Yeah. It doesn't really work without but, it. But I mean, the crowd, the fans turned out, no? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but then, you know, so that, and Connor Kennedy was the first guy. Uh, he played in, I guess he maybe started in 2019. And, uh, and then Adam Rogers joined us for this last run this 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 year. So, uh, and you know they're very different kinds of players. I like them both a lot. Um, uh, but you know, it's uh, it's it's certainly different. It's very different to play the entire gig with just one guitar. Yeah. To have a second guitar player uh, gives me a break for sure, and you know it gives us that two guitar thing that's that's kind of necessary on a few tunes, you know. Is there going to be any new music coming? Yeah, I don't know. Um, you mean like more recording or anything like that? Uh, something from Steely Dan, maybe? Uh, I don't know. Um, my guess is that there won't be any new Steely Dan records that are uh, with new music, only because I think that's that's sort of a brand of yeah. that required Walter. You know, we were able to do a, a Steely Dan live record. Yeah, you know, of got course. It. Uh, and uh that came out pretty well i think but uh but that's all music that walter and donald composed together so i think if if donald is to do any more recording it'll likely be a solo record you know a donald fagan record yeah like like you know like he's done you know with morph the cat and with uh you know uh sunken condos and then the and then the nightfly live record you know yeah so. So yeah, I mean that that I can certainly imagine that happening because he's he's sort of a you know he can't stop himself from writing. He likes he just he's kind of a restless creative type. So yeah. you know, he's he's always got you know ideas churning. I think so. It wouldn't surprise me if he uh, has some songs already that he'd like to yeah. record. So, so but I don't know. I don't know the details. So yeah. Did you get the pictures of the three guitars I want to talk yeah, to? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> I remember those. Yeah. So <laughs> I fondly, yeah. I mean, they're all they were all like guitars I really enjoyed. I just yeah. got to a point where I had too many and uh I was starting you know, I, I wasn't making good use of them and uh I, I had space for them, but um but I wouldn't, I wouldn't get to play them enough. So that, you know, sometimes I would take a guitar out of the case and because I hadn't seen it in six months, it was, you know, unplayable. You'd have to like get the guitar, the, the guitar repair guy in there and like, you know, or at least spend some time adjusting the neck. And so it just felt like it wasn't, it wasn't the best of yeah, circumstances. You, you, when you signed the, the Hamer for me, you told me that was the last guitar you had to buy. <laughs> I did buy that one, actually. I remember that. Yeah, it, I love that guitar. It was, it, and it was. Uh, Hamers were really interesting guitars. They, uh, they, they had a quality that. It's funny. I, I played one in a Broadway show for not the one you bought, but uh, one that uh, looked similar. It was a double cutaway, but it was also sort of a semi hollow body, and it uh -huh. had uh, maybe one F hole or something like that. I forget what it was called. Very nice guitar, and uh, I needed a guitar I could play on this. Uh, Elton John show Aida, which was the Broadway show, and I, I got the, I had the chair, one of the guitar chairs to to play in that show, and uh, 
because they wanted us to leave a guitar there for subs if I wasn't going to be there. And I was subbing out a lot because I was still on the road quite a bit at the time. And uh, so I had to I had to pick a guitar that would work for the show, but that I could leave in the pit and that I didn't need to use elsewhere, you know. So so I picked that Hamer. And uh, I don't know, I forget why, but I remember one time bringing a different guitar in there and maybe playing a Gibson or something, or I forget which guitar, but I brought another one. And the conductor is like looking at me funny and like he's, he really missed the sound of the hammer that yeah. I'd been playing all the time. He got used to it. And what I noticed about it was that it, it sat in a track in a, in a beautiful way. It, like a, a Gibson, like my 336 um, or most 335s, I think they're, they're a wider frequency rangers and they cover more turf and that's why they have such a beautiful solo sound because they it's a big sound it's a wide frequency response and the hamers maybe because they're solid bodies or something about uh, maybe the woods or like the size or something but they, they're they're kind of they sit kind of more narrowly they're, they don't have a lot of low end that, that like that gets unwieldy and and there's a beautiful sort of focused mid-range and, and it just sort of sits there and you can it stays at one level and it's it's just nice in a track not problematic and i think he was hearing that and loved that uh, and he missed it when it was when it, when i brought a gibson to play or something it was funny i was surprised but then i started thinking you know he's right it does have a really unique sound and that hammer has it too so, so i think it's something about the size is was that a double cutaway or is that a single that's a double cutaway, right yeah it's a double yeah okay um you call that the like so guitar it is because that's one song I know I used it on. Um, and it was funny because I, I, it's, uh, it's the rhythm guitar on that. That's, I don't think there's any lead guitar on that song anyway, but, uh, there's a, you know, a basic part that's kind of, you know, basic important part that's, that drives the whole song. And when it's, uh, <laughs> And uh, I like a neck pickup for the sound of it, and I wanted to use a little distortion on it. And and as even when I play that one, that has too much bottom. It's it's interesting right there. I like that wouldn't work for me. I'd have to roll off all the bottom end, and like it's it needs it needs to cut, but sort of sit in a little place in the track, and and uh, that's too big, you know. And uh, but the but the hammer on that neck pickup, and maybe it's the P ninety two. That probably helps too. You know, it's uh, it's a really there's a mid-range kind of, you know, sort of peak or something that that uh, it just really, you know, it 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 somehow calls attention to itself, but doesn't get in the way of other instruments. And that's what I think I like about it. Yeah. Next came the George Benson. Oh yeah, that I missed that one. <laughs> it's really easy to play. It was kind of it, it's it's compact for a jazz guitar. It uh, it's just so comfortable and. Uh, and I always had flat wound strings on it, which is probably what it had on it when you got it. Um, and it has this kind of amazing sort of articulate attack, you know, it's, a, it's, it's also not a lot of bottom end on that, not a lot of volume on that guitar either, which was great if you're going to play electrically because it won't feed back. I never had problems with it that way. And, and it's just, it's got a real crisp sort of attack and it's got a woody tone when you listen to it ring, you know. Um, yeah, I kind of missed that guitar. I uh, you called it the cousin Dupree guitar. Pardon me. You called it the cousin Dupree guitar. Oh yes, I, I used it on that song, which is I, I'm surprised I even bought that, brought that to the session um, for that. But I guess maybe they asked for something like that. But or maybe I just wanted to be prepared for sort of to have some sonic choices, and it was a different one. Yeah, I forget that part, but it was you know like it had. Uh, Let's see. I can't. You guys can't see this. Thing. I lift this up here. But uh, you know, like, uh, like uh, some part like that. Uh, I forget the rest of it, but it had a little. Uh, I forget now. That's kind of a groove. Oh yeah. Those two. Those two little little things were were in there, but it it, it had a, again it had a kind of a a distinctive sound and it's a, a really really kind of crisp attack and uh, 
you could just sort of it, it sits in the track very nicely i don't think it was difficult to mix you know you just you, you kind of it cuts in a nice way but again doesn't doesn't disturb you know, any of the other things that are going on but uh yeah that's a that's a i think the reason i i kind of i was okay parting with that guitar was because it's it's it sounds so much like george benson's sound you know yeah that uh <laughs> I think I was, I, I, I've been such a fan of George Benson and uh, for every once in a while, I'll like, I, at least in the past, and I haven't done it recently, but like I would really obsess about his lines and try to like transcribe a lot of his lines and learn how to play a lot of that stuff. And, and uh, I was actually kind of worried that like, if I kept that guitar, I'd, it would be too strong an influence, you know. I, I yeah. kind of wanted to sort of distance myself from it because it was it was too overwhelmingly powerful. Because I think he's so great, you know. Yeah. So, but I kind of miss. That. I don't know. I think because if I were playing different things on it and not playing George Benson style stuff on it, I, I think it would be a very useful guitar, which is what I did on Cousin Dupree, and uh, I made a solo jazz record a couple years ago, and I'm making another one for. Like that's a, that has a holiday theme, and that would have been a good guitar for for those tunes. It yeah. would be perfect guitar for that, I think. But uh, and then there's uh, the, then it there's, was gone. Yeah. <laughs> then there's the Fender. Oh yeah, that, that's a wild one. I had forgotten about that. The Telesonic. Yeah, that's a that's a very strange guitar. I think it must have been uh, a design that they came up with after maybe. Fender bought Gretsch. I think that's what happened. There was a merger back there at, yeah. right before that guitar came out because those are those classic sort of Dynasonic pickups, you know, the, the single coil pickups that yeah. are on it. And uh, those were on Gretsch, those were famously on early Gretsch guitars. And uh, and it had a really, really different sound. I'm always comfortable playing the Tele shape. And that, so I always, I have a lot of, I've had a lot of Tellys and still do have several of that body shape. I don't have any fenders anymore, but, uh, but they, but that shape is comfortable for me and it's, it's a classic sound and, uh, and a very useful sound, kind of a versatile guitar. That one's a little different because it, again, I think the reason all those guitars were recording choices, that one I used all over Morph the Cat. Um, and I had brought other guitars to that session, but uh, if you remember, Wayne Krantz is playing guitar on that record too. Yeah. And we, we had the luxury of recording, I think maybe six people or five or six people at once for the rhythm tracking of that record, which was, was fantastic. And, uh, and Wayne was doing, he, he, he clearly committed to his choice of sound and guitar. And, and so I was trying to find like, okay, well, what's going to work if that's a given, we know he's going to be doing that. Like what would be a sonic complement? you know, something that will sound a little different. So it doesn't sound like it's the same sound of guitar or anything. And, uh, and I think I landed on that one because it just doesn't sound like it, it sort of does the great rhythm guitar job. Like a lot of fenders will do because it's sort of, sort of bright and thin. And so you can kind of turn it down, but it still cuts, you know, but it's, but it does it with a different character. There's something about the those pickups, I think, that that change the sound of. Uh, it doesn't sound just like a telly. It's it's a little unusual. I'm not sure how to describe it, but it does feel different to play. Yeah, like probably like a duo jet might feel. Maybe it's sort of like a telly leaning towards a, a Gretsch duo jet or something. It's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So that's the uh, conversation on the three guitars. Can I ask you a couple of just other questions? Oh, sure, sure. sure. So the last time uh, my wife, Terry, and I talked to you, it was in Albuquerque. Uh -huh. And uh, your daughter was trying to get into law school in oh, wow. <laughs> St. Louis. That's right. She did go to Wash U in St. Louis. Yeah. And she, is she done? She got, she got her law, law degree uh, quite a while ago. She's been an attorney for five years now. So that must have been, oh, about, not, must have been about eight or nine years ago, at least that we, that we last connected. Um, she's living out in, uh, in the Silicon Valley area of California in Mountain View, California, where her office is in Palo Alto. She works for a firm called Cooley, which is a, is a big, uh, big firm with other offices, but, uh, she's, she's in the, in, uh, her old stomping grounds yeah. in, in the Bay area. Yeah. She went to 
her undergraduate work was done at Berkeley, so she uh, still has some friends that are out there. So it was kind of like going home again. So uh, yeah. although she misses New York, I don't know. She I don't know if she'll ever come back to this coast. But <laughs> yeah. you live in New York. I live in Manhattan. Yeah. Yeah. I've been here since 1984. So, yeah. And so you're getting. Ready I guess to go it's over. official. I guess it's official. <laughs> yeah. So you're getting ready to go overseas, huh? Yeah. At the end of September, um, I'm going to join Madeline Peru uh, on a about a month's worth of work. We, uh, I start in London. I, they'll be there in uh, in all over Britain, I think, uh, sooner than I start. Uh, but I'm going to join for the, her London show, and then I forget where we go, but I think there's some some dates in maybe maybe the Netherlands or in France, maybe in Spain. We'll, we'll be moving around a little bit. And then we come back to the U.S., and there's there. I think we start in Cincinnati. There are a couple more shows in the U.S. that I'll stay with her through the end of that little run. So it's about a month. So, you like uh, playing with her, don't you? I do. It's it's you know it's really uh, it's such a it's such a different uh, musical experience from Steely Dan, you know. So the the two are sort of uh, in some ways it couldn't be more different. I mean, Steely Dan is uh, it's a real electric gig, you know. It's and it's kind of it's I mean it's not as loud as some bands but it's but it's loud and it's a big production it's 13 people in the band and you know i'm playing playing a big amp and you know big pedal board and like several guitars that you know people are handing me for different songs and with madeline we it's it's much more stripped down it's very quiet like like uh, surprisingly it's kind of radically quiet which i really love uh it's easy on the ears that way but it's also playing quietly seems to be sort of a lost art and it, and it's really an effective uh, way to get an audience to lean in and listen more. And, and she does that really well. She sort of insists on that. It never, we never play loud, yeah. which I, I really love. Um, um, so it's the, another side of the, of my musicality that it draws on. And, uh, and it's the closest thing to a jazz gig I get really to play. Cause it, I play sort of with a jazz sound and it's, it's pretty clean and I just, it's a simple setup and, not a lot of effects it's 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 more it, you know it's like well it's like her music if you know her music yeah, at all it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. so on the new steely dan the live live record is that you on guitar uh the two live records that, that we did uh, uh um came from uh the touring that we did in 2019 uh, it, and the one is the Steely Dan Northeast Corridor record. The other one's uh, the Night Flyer, mm -hmm. the, the Night Fly Live. And that's, I think, the whole record live. Um, they came from the same tour, both the Steely Dan band. And at the time, yeah, I'm on all that, of course. And uh, and Connor Kennedy was the other guitar player on there. So you'll hear me and Connor both on those on both those records. Yeah, the um, the guitar solos are a little different. Um on that record particularly different again. from Kid different from what different, different oh. from uh the record yeah yeah i don't i don't i typically don't play uh what larry played although i i have learned it and i i enjoy playing it once in a while i will i think i used to throw it in occasionally on album nights when we'd be playing the uh the whole uh royal scam out mm -hmm. i think it's the Royal scam album you know and uh it starts with kid charlemagne i think and uh and sometimes i would actually bother to play his whole solo which is which is it's brilliant and fun, um, but in general, I I uh, I try I, I aim for sort of something that's usually sonically similar, but but I I I try to improvise a bit and also uh, you know I, I want to play something appropriate, but I don't want to I don't want it to be a sort of copy of the record. That's that's not my intention, and I think it, the reason for that is because the whole vibe of the of our band is is not it, it's not like a the job is not to recreate the originals the job is to play those songs and uh donald's always been uh you know interested in jazz and is in, he's always encouraging the players in the band to to come ready to improvise and not not to, he he wants he has high standards for musical values. He wants it in tune. He wants it in time. He wants it to feel great. 
wants the tone to be great everything everything all the musical values he's he wants he's just as fussy about those as he was when he made those records but he's not looking to recreate the like note for note what happened on those records uh and he, he wants it to be sort of alive in a spontaneous way every show and i i think that's what saves us from being one of those sort of you know like oldies bands or right. like a tribute band or a cover band or something i mean you know or or a band that like because there are people who will just sort of play their hits and not really be deeply engaged or invested in it but just they're just going for the ka you know yeah. and it just has never felt like that way with donald and walter it's uh it's always they somehow they they create a vibe at the top which encourages everybody to really show up and care about playing and we're playing here tonight and it's going to be it's going to be different tonight and and there's room it's open-ended in other words so you can bring your creative energy and there's an outlet for it it's not it's not something like a like a broadway show where you play the same part every night and you're kind of yawning or you're you're reading a book at the same time as you're playing. <laughs> you know it's not that and and thank god you know like it's it's it was a lifesaver for me because uh you know, um, I, I've done that other kind of work and because uh, I've needed the money, you know, but but uh, to have a situation where, um, you know, creative demands are made on me, too, is is just that's that's just uh, I'm forever grateful for that yeah. opportunity. It's fantastic. You know, so. yeah. Well, John, thanks for talking to me. Thanks. for All right, Doug. Yeah, I hope you're enjoying those guitars. I am. <laughs> Maybe I'll catch you guys next time on the road. I certainly hope so. Thank you, John. All right. Bye-bye.